So I, um, what I want to try to do today is to look at the middle portion of the Amida, not the beginning blessings and not the ending blessings and <clears throat> not the Kedusha, but that middle section that differs depending on the day. So it, it in case what I just said doesn't make any sense to you, um, each of the major services contains the Amida. Shacharit, Mincha, Mariv, Musaf, all of the main services of the Siddur <clears throat> center around the same tefillah, same prayer. And uh, we call that prayer the Shemona Esrei, the Amida, uh, the, the Tefillah. When the classic rabbis talked about it, they just called it the Tefillah. Because it's really the heart of, and it's the one thing that is consistent in any major service in the Siddur. Is that it will have the first three blessings, the last three blessings, and something regarding the kind of day it is in the middle. Is it a regular weekday? Is it a Shabbat morning? Is it a Shabbat Musaf? Is it a Yom Tov morning? Is it a Yom Tov Musaf? Um, all of those will have a slightly different middle section. Now, <clears throat> that means that the beginning section and the ending section are more or less identical on all days. And we'll look at all of that. Okay, I just wanna give a quick intro first. Um, and that the main difference, variation, is that middle section. And uh, that varies really depending on the day. Okay. Let's jump in here into the Siddur. Um, are you all, um, just sort of by a quick show of hands, um, are you all looking in a Siddur or are you looking on the screen? Looking in the Siddur? I'm looking in the Siddur. Okay. Um, anybody looking on the screen? A little bit. Okay, I just, I just wanna know, um, uh, I'm, I also have a Siddur with me because, honestly, I, I, I feel like that for an exercise like this, uh, books, actual books, are a, a more efficient technology. It's easier to flip 20 pages in the book than it is to scroll 20 pages on okay. the website. I'm going to get so, my, I'll get my Siddur now. That's neither here nor there. Um, <clears throat> where we are in the Siddur is on page 162. So turn to page 162. And uh, just before we start this section, I'm going to go back a few pages to the beginning of the Amidah. Tfilat HaAmidah L'Shacharit L'Shabbat. The Amidah prayer for the Shacharit service of Shabbat. So that should locate you in the Siddur. <clears throat> Anybody need a minute to get it? Okay. <clears throat> These brachot, the, the, the Amidah is constructed of brachot. A minimum of seven and a maximum of 19. Uh, they all begin with the same three brachot, with only the tiniest variations around the high holidays, <clears throat> but basically the same three brachot. This is the first one, you're, you're familiar with it. It's, um, you see here in our Siddur, 
we have with the matriarchs <clears throat> and with only the patriarchs. <clears throat> I, I think the last, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure I'm guessing a little bit, but I'm mostly right. I think within the last 10 to 20 years, the <clears throat> majority percentage has shifted. It was that the majority said with, without matriarchs and some said with, and now I think we're at the point where the majority say with and some say without. Okay. Um, I, <clears throat> for the longest time, I never added the, the imahot, uh, mostly because I was still using the sidur that didn't have them printed in it. And um, it was a matter of efficiency, I think. But uh, all it really took was serving in one or two congregations where that was their custom for it to become very easy and natural and part of my own custom. And so I feel like, yeah, that's how I say it. Even though for many years it wasn't. Okay, <clears throat> that's neither here nor there. <clears throat> uh, the bracha, that's what I'm interested in, is Baruch Ata Adonai. Um, traditionally, it would be Magain Avraham, the shield, the defender, like Haganah, Magain, right? You know, the Haganah, the Tzva Haganah, the defense. It means the defender, the shield of Abraham. And we say Magain Avraham. So that's the first bracha. And it's the same on weekday morning minyan, weekday mincha, weekday mariv, uh, Rosh Hashanah morning. It's always the same. Um, uh, all of the, the next bracha is also the same. Baruch atah Hashem, mechaye hametim. You, God, who uh, give life to the dead. It's also the same every day. Three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening, no matter what day it is of the year, you say that bracha is the second bracha. Um, the third bracha is um, also the same. And it, it, when you daven with a minion, you say the kedusha in between, the second and third bracha. And when you daven without a minion, you skip the kedusha, As you see here, it says the kedusha is recited only with a minion. And either way, the bracha you say at the end is the same. It's ha'el ha'kadosh. You praise God, God's holiness. You, God, are the holy El, the holy highest one. Okay. Those are always the same, one, two, and three. Now, before we get to the middle, I'm going to skip to the end. Okay, so we're going to move through. <clears throat> Turn to page 163. There's three brachot that conclude every Amidah. One of them is Hamachazir Shechinato Litzion. It's actually at the top of 164. The lead-in paragraph is here. But the blessing, the bracha, is you, God, praise are you, God, who restores your divine presence to Zion, to Zion. It's a complicated theology, this blessing, that I don't really want to get into. But um, nonetheless, every day we recall our uh, connection to Zion, to Zion, to that particular place. And we pray God will return God's presence, the Shekhinah, to Zion. And then we say Modim, right? We bow. Modim Anach Nulach. <clears throat> and uh, you can see that there's two paragraphs here. 
one that said quietly and one in the regular Amidah and one that said quietly by the congregation when the leader recites this out loud in the repetition. And the reason they did that is because uh, there were two proposed texts for the prayer, for the we are grateful, we thank you. This is a prayer of thanksgiving, of gratitude. Modim like toda, mode, I'm thankful. Um, we are thankful before you. There were two proposed texts. These are them. And they, they, they solved the debate by saying, we'll use them both. One, when everybody says it quietly to themselves, and the other, when the leader repeats, you'll say this other one quietly to yourself. But the blessing that concludes it is always the same. Baruch ata Adonai, hatov shimcha ulecha na'e lehodot. Your name is good, and it is good to praise you, to give you thanksgiving, to thank you. Your name is goodness, tov shimcha, and to you, it is good to give thanks. In, in the translation here, praise. That's the second one. The third one that we always say is the Birkat Shalom. We always end the Amida with Baruch Ata Adonai Hamevarech et Amo Yisrael Bashalom. You pray, you bless your people Israel, who blesses your people Israel with Shalom, with peace. And that's the end. So, first three are always the same. Last three are always the same. Magen Avraham Ufoked Sarah, Mechaye Hametim, and Ha'el Hakadosh. Those are the first three. Try to like sink that into memory. Magen Avraham Ufoked Sarah, Mechaye Hametim, you give life to the dead. That's this one here. And Ha'el Hakadosh. Rabbi, would you say the three in English? Yes. Magen Avraham Ufoked Sarah means who, who protects Abraham, the shield of Abraham, and the guardian of Sarah. The second one is um, who gives life to the dead. And the third one is um, the holy God. Praise to you, Adonai, Ha'el HaKadosh, the holy God. Any questions up to there? What, what does it mean, give life to the dead? Yeah, what does it mean? I knew as soon as you said that, Sue, and I could see that look on your face. I could see it. I knew it was coming. I was like, okay, I'm going to ask about that. And then I didn't want to disappoint. Talk. Then you're going to have to talk about it, and that's okay. Like, I'm good with that. It's okay, slow me down a little bit. It's cool. So... Um, it, it, it's complicated, Sue. It's, um, um, it, um, if you look at the uh, text that leads in, there's all of these blessings have introductory paragraphs, longer paragraphs that um, set the spiritual tone and the content of the blessing they lead you into it they set the background and then there's a formal khatima a signature 
Baruch Ata Adonai, bam, 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 whatever the rest is. That's called in Hebrew the Chatima, um, which in modern Hebrew means a signature. Your, your Chatima is your signature. So it means the closing, the thing at the end that, that, that contains the essential. Um, Mechaye is the present tense um, of the to make live, to cause life. Who causes to live? Like lechayim, mechaye. And met means a, a dead person. Metim are the dead. Um, the paragraph that precedes it says, um, you are mighty Adonai. You give life to the dead. You sustain the living through kindness and love. And with great mercy, you give life to the dead. You support the falling, heal the sick, loosen the chains of those who are bound. And this is the line that's really tough. And keep faith with those who sleep in the dust. Yikes. Wow, right? I mean, like, who, are, who is that? Who is it that sleeps in the dust it's dead people mm -hmm. right it's people who who are no longer conscious this is a prayer about life and death there's no question about it um uh who is like you god i mean nobody right you, you, i i'm i just started rereading frankenstein it's all about like, can you give life? Like, what does it mean? To who can control life and death? Right? Nobody. The answer is nobody but God. Right? So that's the thing. Who's like you, Adonai? Who could compare to you? The one King, who in whose hands is life and death, and death and life. And it it does seem to be about. The resurrection of the dead. Uh, the simplest way, I think, to understand this is to understand it as uh, this is an allusion to the literal resurrection of the dead. That God will have the power and the capacity at some time to literally undo death. and bring life to those who were once dead. Now, <clears throat> you should know that <clears throat> there's a, in classical Judaism, there's kind of a very strong divide between those who believe that the Bible uh, teaches the, um, uh, the rejuvenation of the dead and those who believe that the Bible does not. And if you believe that, you know, okay, that's fine. You can believe whatever you want, but that is, this is not biblically based. And there's pretty good evidence to say that the Bible does not really believe in the, um, in the regeneration of the dead. Um, when people die in the Bible, pretty much with very rare exception like elijah kind of disappears right there's something kind of weird about that right there's like somebody else who sort of kind of doesn't really die maybe but basically in the bible when you die you're dead and you don't come back to life resurrection of the dead is not a biblical notion now, there's some allusions to it, maybe, right? Things like that. But it's really a, an idea which comes into Judaism post-biblical. Um, the whole paragraph, Sue, is problematic. First of all, you have to ask, do you believe in the literal resurrection of the dead? If you don't, then you have to understand this in some other way. In what way, then, the question becomes, do you understand 
God gives life to those who are no longer living. Memory, as long as we live, they live. Right, things, you know, there are ways to think about it that are meaningful. It's some not, people, it's not literally coming back to life. Well, like, some people believe that that is true, that there will be some messianic, miraculous, ultimate resurrection of all people who are dead. And you will, you know, once again, um, you know, be with all who ever lived. Um, me, I don't know. So you probably know me well enough already to know that that is really not me. I, I, I'm like, what? Right. I, I think that's, that's the kind of idea people throw around in religious circles without really thinking about it that much. Are you kidding me? Double the population of the world right now. And and how would you come back? And in what way would you come back? And at what age would you come back? And what about um, uh, people who died in utero? Right, I mean, like, it doesn't take long to, to you know, pick apart those kinds of theologies with simple questions. I, I, I didn't even answer any of those questions. I just asked them. So for me, this is not about the resurrection of the, of the dead physically. No, this is not what that is. This is about the powers and forces which transcend life and death. Our life is, and here's how I, this is, this is just pure me, 100% pure me. Okay. Um, our life is so radically insignificant in the cosmic history of the universe. We were a tiny little piece of a tiny little piece in a tiny little corner on a tiny little speck of dust in the tiniest little regions of Nowhereville. I mean, really, space is big, big, bigger than big. A billion, billion years is a really long time. Our life is, the tradition says, is like the blink of God's eye. It's an instant. And that is... And none of that diminishes the incredible, miraculous, wonderfulness of life. We toast Lechaim. Even knowing that our life is so small, we still say life is the greatest, most amazing miracle of all. And, we, and, and everything we're about is Lechaim. It's not a denial of life. It's a recognition that this is one small piece of a much greater picture which we are essentially unaware of. We're asked to have faith and confidence that this one manifestation is a tiny piece of what life and God and soul are really all about. And whatever this life is, there's an awful lot more. Mm -hmm. That's what we're asked to, to, to hold in our head. So um, when someone's sick, when someone dies, when it is hard, um, we, we turn over our powerlessness to the great almighty power of the universe who holds life and death in hand. You know, we... Uh, I don't, I don't understand it. Me, I, I don't I don't know. Okay, so nobody, all of that very knows. intense. Hold on. Okay. Um uh, just just look though at the at the text there, because I, I, I want to say one more thing about this this bracha, and then I want to kind of uh, go back to the other topic. Um we say a number of things here that are really for me, this is a, I, I like to use this blessing as an example of what for me tefillah really is. Um, and what I'm really doing when I say these words. So there's a, there's a series of three things here. Um, 
that are really interesting. I like to teach this. Um, you sustain living through kindness and love, right? Mechal keel chayim. And let's face it, we live, right? The life itself is a miracle. How come I'm living? Why does my heart keep ticking? Where does the electricity come from? What is the origin of life and ideas and thought? What makes me alive and conscious? It's God. It's chesed. It's this deep, you know, amazing power of the universe. Mechayei metim. He gives power and life to this raw flesh. Somech noflim. He supports those who are fallen. Sometimes God helps you when you are suffering. Just gives you support when you're suffering. Doesn't take it away. You're still suffering. Sometimes rofei cholim. Sometimes God heals the sick. It's true. Sometimes people with terminal illnesses get better. Right now, there are a dozen doctors, the best doctors in the world, who are working nonstop to solve and cure every single kind of cancer that exists. People do get better sometimes. And sometimes, Matira Surim, God releases those who are bound, by which I understand it to mean releases us from this life. Sometimes living is hard and burdensome. I'm sure every one of you knows someone who felt like when somebody passed away close to them, they felt like as sad as they were, they also felt it was a relief because it could be hard, living could be hard. And sometimes you don't get better and you don't just stay okay, you, you get redeemed and released from life. I, I teach this because it shows us that we can make statements about God that aren't always true. Sometimes things happen one way. Sometimes things happen another way. I had this, this, this very experience with my own parents. They don't always get better. People don't always get better. But sometimes they do. And sometimes healing does take place. And that is also miraculous. This is a blessing about miracles of life and death and healing and, and, and asks us to consider our life from a much further and higher perspective. Bigger, bigger, bigger perspective. Is any of that helpful, Sue? I don't know. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I think you just can't take, I can't take this literally. Is that right. is the answer? You just, I can't take it literally. So I have to make it me meaningful either. to me. No, me neither. But <laughs> I, but I have found in it over time a very um, meaningful connection. Mm -hmm. And its recitation is very personal and I do mean something by it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions there? All right, so I, I do want to get to um, these middle passages, which starts here, where you see where it says, all continue here. That means whether you prayed with the minyan or not, um, whether you included the Kedusha or not, you'll, you'll continue here. And you see it says the fourth bracha. So on Shabbat, it's not the Shmona Esrei, it's not the 18 blessings. On Shabbat, it's seven. Three at the beginning, three at the end, and that one in the middle that's about the day. The prayer in the middle is about the day you're on. And this one is about the 
Kedusha, the holiness of Shabbat. Because remember, we say Kiddush on Shabbat, Mekadesh HaShabbat, right? It's all about uh, when we read the, the blessing, we say that God declared the Shabbat holy. Keep the Sabbath day, le kodsho, to its holiness. Okay. So um, this middle blessing is going to be about Shabbat. And we're going to offer a blessing of gratitude for Shabbat. Moshe rejoiced in his portion. Yismach Moshe. And you called him a faithful servant, Eved Ne'eman. That's the quoting from the Bible. Those are words that God uses about Moshe. You were Ne'eman. We, that's, that's sort of the go-to way the rabbis refer to Moses. You adorned his head, Moses' head, with a brilliant crown. Do you remember that story of Moses' head, how Moses' face shined as he came down from Mount Sinai? as he carried down the two tablets inscribed with the Shabbat. I mean, Shabbat, after all, is on the Ten Commandments. It's, it's one of the ten biggies. So Moshe was ecstatic to bring the Shabbat down from Mount Sinai into the world. And can we just say that this is one of the best ideas ever in the whole history of ideas? is to rest from all industry and labor and work one out of every seven days forever and ever. That is, that is like major holiness idea right there. And I think that's the sense that's trying to convey here. Simcha, it's, 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 it was a matana, it was a gift. It was a, a joyfulness, this it was like a like a crowned jewel that was brought down. And this is what it said. And then it quotes directly from the Torah. Veshamru b'nei Yisrael et ha-shabbat la'asot et ha-shabbat ledorotam berit olam. We say this on Shabbat many times when we say Kiddush. Between me and the people of Israel for all times, it is a sign. This is like one of the, this is like the wedding ring of us and God. It's a sign. It's a symbol. It means something. Observing and keeping the Shabbat between us is, is an example of our covenant. Because God made the heavens and earth and God rested, so we rest. And then um, we continue a little bit. And this is, a, you know, um, this is one of those things in our Siddur that says, some omit. Maybe you've seen this here and there. I don't know if you ever really even noticed this. I always wonder, like, do people notice and do they wonder why, why do some omit? And do you omit it when you say it? Um, in our shul, we do not repeat the Amidah which means we never say this out loud. I'm, 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 I'm trying to figure out a good weekend to, to do that, where we say it, where we say it quietly, everybody says it quietly, and then the reader repeats the Amida, so that we sing all the stuff in the middle, because we never sing this whole thing here. But there is a, there's a portion of this, which in traditional Sidurim, um, expresses a negative attitude towards other nations as a way of expressing a positive attitude about us and the amazing inheritance we have of the Shabbat. We say, God, you did not give this to everybody else, to those other nations. Nor did you, our sovereign, our king, bestow this on idol worshipers. And that is true. Right? I mean, it's not untrue, but some people don't like to pray in the negative. 
They don't like to say negative stuff about other people. They don't like to say crush our enemies. You know, they don't. So, and I get that. That's cool. If you're like that, I understand that. But I also understand the other. I think it's a very natural impulse to desire the downfall of your enemies. And I have no problem with that personally. I don't think that makes you a bad person or you have to only think nice thoughts about everybody. No, sometimes the other guy doesn't do it right. And you can say, hey, you know what? I'm glad I'm not like them because those guys over there, they, they worship falsehood and I'm not into that. And you, God, asks us to worship what's true and right in Shabbat. Okay, like, again, it doesn't matter to me. I, I appreciate that our Siddur gives you an option, though I do think it complicates uh, the, the issue for people. And it places a responsibility on the davener to decide. You have to decide now. And I think that's part of the conservative Jewish approach is, again, to entrust people with their own davening. You can decide what words you want to say and what words you don't want to say. And I encourage people routinely to, if you don't like something, leave it out. Don't say it. Maybe you'll come back to it and say it again. Don't take it out of the sidur. Don't edit it out unless it's really offensive. Um, but it continues with the positive side of this because to Yisrael, to us, you've given the Shabbat. To us and to our descendants whom you've chosen, the people who sanctify the seventh day, we feel fulfilled and we delight in the goodness of the seventh day, the rest and oneg and joyfulness that comes with the Shabbat. For you yourself, God, even God loved resting on the seventh day and called it Kadosh, the most beloved of all days and the symbol of the miracles of creation. Uh, our God and God of our ancestors, we ask you, we, we ask that our rest be desirable to you. Make us holy through the mitzvot of Shabbat. And let Torah be our portion. Fill our lives with goodness, gladness, with the, your deliverance, and purify our hearts, our motivations to serve you in truth. You, God lovingly and willingly granted us as the great inheritance, the Holy Shabbat. That the people Israel who make your name holy might find rest on this day. Praise are you Adonai who makes Shabbat holy. Mekadesh HaShabbat. That's the Chatima of all that paragraph. And that's the fourth bracha. And then you see, we go to the fifth bracha, which is the first of the last three, five, six, and seven. So on Shabbat, we have seven brachot, the first three, the last three, and Mekadesh HaShabbat. Um, do, you, do you know this melody? Kodesh Heinu, Kodesh Heinu. Kodshenu be mitzvotecha, v'tein chelkeinu b'toratecha. Do you know that? I don't. No, there are, there are a few very nice settings to this, and you can see it's bolded here. Um, and you can see it's written over here in the red in... Um, uh, transliteration because it's often sung in congregations where the congregation says quietly through the Amidah and then the Chazan or the Baal Tefillah repeats through the Kedusha with everybody and then everybody sits down and the Chazan continues four, five, six, and seven 
reciting and singing, leading congregational singing through the repetition of the Amidah. Many synagogues uh, uh, don't do that because it just takes longer. Yes. Right? And, uh, and people start to check out. There's, there's pluses and minuses. I, I, you know, I'm not really chiming in on that all that much. Um, there's something gained and something lost, I think, each time. Each way, rather. All right. Any questions up to there? All right. I want to move ahead to page 188. All right. We got a little bit of time, yeah? We're not going to get to all of them. I knew we wouldn't get to all of them. We're going to get to the two of the Shabbat morning, though. The Shacharit and the Musaf. We'll get to Yom Tov in a, in a future time. Okay, page 188. Here you see Musaf le Shabbat, the Amidah, the Musaf Amidah for Shabbat. And again, you can see that this begins the same as the Shacharit Amidah with the blessing Baruch Atah Adonai Magen Avraham Ufoked Sarah, the shield of Abraham, the guardian of Sarah. And then it continues with this, support the sick, heal the sick, loosen the chains of the, of the bound, um, and praise the you Adonai who gives life to the dead. And after the Kedusha, which is a little different from the Shacharit one, but I don't want to look at the Kedusha today, um, we have Ha'el HaKadosh. So again, the first three brachot, the first three chatimot are all the same for Shacharit and for Musaf, identical. But then it changes. And here you see it says the fourth bracha, Shabbat and the temple service. Unlike Shachari, which is going to reflect on the Torah perspective of Shabbat. Shabbat as mentioned in the Ten Commandments and Shabbat as mentioned in the miracles of creation in the first chapter of Genesis. Those are the two main five book of Moses places where Shabbat is like mentioned as holy. Genesis at the beginning and in the Ten Commandments. This is going to talk about the temple service, the sacrificial service in the temple for Shabbat. And you can see here already we have an alternative version, not centered on the sacrifices, continues on the next page. There's a stream within modern Judaism, within some of traditional Judaism, within Reconstructionist Judaism, and a, and a portion of the conservative um, uh, community that doesn't really want to pray about the sacrifices anymore. We don't want to pray for the rebuilding of the temple and the renewal of the sacrificial cult. We can pray about it historically. This is what they used to do, and we appreciate it. And you can see here in the, in the Hebrew even in the version that talks about the sacrifices, the conservative Sidur makes a, a subtle change from older traditional Sidurs. It says, Asu Vehikrivu. They offered and they did and offered in the past tense. Not, as it would be in traditional Orthodox Sidurim, na'ase v'nakriv. We will do and we will sacrifice. So already in an earlier generation in, the, in conservative Sidurim, we changed the reflection on the sacrifices 
to talk about it in the past tense, not in the present tense, or, in, or rather, and not in the future tense, like we want this to be again. But they do give you an alternate, which doesn't talk about the Shabbat sacrifices. It talks about the Shabbat pleasure and joyfulness and the music and the loveliness and all of the good goodness of Shabbat without talking about specifically the sacrifices that were offered on Shabbat. Personally, I've prayed them both. I've tried both. Um, I was raised and trained, um, and in my early rabbinic life, I prayed the traditional way. Um, I, I came to a place where I realized I really don't want the sacrificial system to come back. I don't want that. I don't want the temple to be rebuilt. So all of my prayers regarding that are completely metaphorical. And so given that, I'm okay going back and forth between one that does and doesn't mention the sacrifices explicitly because I don't want it. Now, maybe that shocks you. Maybe you don't like that to hear that from your rabbi. Maybe you do like to hear that from your rabbi. But uh, twice in our history, if you take our theology and our texts seriously, twice in our history, God destroyed the temple because he hated what we were doing then. So I'm not interested in a third time. What were the two times? The first temple in the days of um, yeah. Jeremiah, in the days of Jeremiah. Yeah. The second temple in the, you know, in the year 70, in the days just after Jesus. Twice, he, there, were, there were two temples, and they were yeah, both destroyed by, by enemy nations. And our theology, the, the Talmud, the classic rabbis, were like, it must be something we did. It must be that we were not doing the right thing. And that God despised this place, or else why would God have let this happen? Okay, that's the that's the that's the short, you know. I was trying to figure out why God, why God did, destroyed it, and I thought I don't remember anything about that. I must have slept through that lesson. Well, like I, I want to say, like you know, that was then, like that was how people did stuff back then. We're not the only ones in the ancient world who offered animal, killed animals to appease the gods. We're not the only ones. We think like, oh, it's, it, no, it's not unique. This was the language of spirituality in those days. I, you know, I don't know, what that, but it's not our language. And those people who want it back, honestly, they're, 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 they're fundamentalist zealots. They're the very people who brought destruction on Jerusalem twice, historically. And let me just take a little side detour here. <clears throat> One of the world's most recognizable and iconic buildings stands on the Temple Mount. To build the temple there, you would have to raise it to the ground. Really? You want to do that? Not me. For what? For some whacked out cult of priests? slaughtering dozens of animals every day you think those guys are going to honor me and my rabbinic degree Please. i mean that, that, that that's all such preposterousness as a metaphor it's brilliant and powerful and amazing and it's ancient and deeply rooted so um so uh, so I read the alternate. Right? Why not? What? What? Is, is less than? It's not less than. For me, this is about um, the, the maturation of the Jewish people. When we were young, when we were adolescents, we worshipped in the temple. 
Now we're, we're you know, we're grownups. We're young adults in our history. Um, we, we, we have a different way to worship and to pray and to atone and, and all that stuff. And we're not looking to go back to high school and to doing it the old way just because it's the older way. Okay. That was then, this is now. Thank you. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I, I got it. I, maybe I got a little ranty there, but that's I okay. um, ranty is good. All right, ranty is good. That's good. Yeah, I'm, I, I don't mind. And um, look, I care about what I say in my prayers. What can I, you know, like um, I, I, I'm able to because because I'm practiced. Um, I'm able to make a lot of things metaphorical which are which i don't believe literally and which i don't want literally and metaphor is not weaker or you know you know like somehow less than it's a very powerful met it's you know there these are symbols gestures metaphors efforts that's how you do spiritual practice those are the technologies of spirituality Um, so let's embrace them. All right. I'm going back to the text here. Um, let's look at the traditional one. <clears throat> Tikanta Shabbat. You, you established Shabbat and its korbanot, its sacrifices. You prescribed the details of the service. All of the libations, the pouring out, libations means the pouring out of wine and liquids. Some things, some sacrifices are poured down into the earth and some sacrifices are burned up into the sky, right? There's sort of a, a two directional aspect to it. Uh, those who delight in the Shabbat inherit eternal glory. Shabbat ties you into something eternal. Those who savor Shabbat merit life. Those who love its teaching have chosen to join in its greatness. It, it praises us and Shabbat and us for keeping Shabbat. Adonai, our God, it was at Sinai that you commanded Shabbat and commanded our ancestors to offer a musaf, a secondary, an additional appropriate sacrifice on Shabbat. That's why we're talking about this here in, in Musaf. See, La Kriv Korban Musaf, an additional service. May it be your will, this is our prayer, that uh, you restore our, uh, 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 their descent, the descendants to the land, lead us in joy within the borders, um, there where they offered you our sacrifices, the daily sacrifices and the Musaf, the additional sacrifices, lovingly offered there to you. And then it quotes from the Torah, the commandment to offer an additional uh, sacrifice on Shabbat. Uvi Yoma Shabbat, and on the Shabbat day, two yearling lambs without blemish together, blah, 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 blah. All of the Shabbat Musaf. The additional sacrifices made on top of the regular ones. The... Um, uh, if you look here, it's a reverse acrostic. Here's the Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalid, Hey, Vav, Zion, all the way through Taf. Right? Taf is the last letter, Aleph is the first letter, and you see it's made a little bit larger. They sort of bolded those letters in the text. Um, that's to let you know that this is a reverse acrostic and the alternate um, here if you look here both the rabbinical assemblies Sidur Sim Shalom and the Israeli Masorti Sidur have offered revisions of this bracha emphasizing elements of universal redemption rather than the restoration of the temple offerings. The accompanying prayers written by Simcha Roth and Zev Kanan 
uh, under the direction of the editor follow in that tradition. And here you see they wrote it with a reverse acrostic. There's the Toph, there's the Aleph. So it would be similar in its experience. And when you get to the very end of all of those things, the same bracha is in the Musaf, that fourth bracha, the Chatima, is still Mekadesh HaShabbat. Who makes the Sabbath holy. So both the Shabbat middle and the Musaf, the Shachri and the Musaf, the middle paragraphs are very, very different. One emphasizes the biblical nature of the Ten Commandments and the inheritance of the Shabbat to the Israelites and God the Creator. And the Musaf uh, recalls the temple service and the way that it was done and the additional elements of Shabbat. But they both have the same Chatima, the same Bracha. First three, middle one, last three. Any questions on any of that? Too much? Too heady? Oh, it's interesting. Good. Good, good, good. Um, uh, try to be mindful of this, this Shabbat. Um, and in the next coming Shabbat, be mindful of the differences between the Shacharit Amida and the Musaf Amida. Don't worry as much about the first three blessings and the last three blessings. Go straight to the middle, right? And spend more time thinking about and working in the middle, imagining them, trying to understand the metaphor and the language, becoming familiar with the words. Just don't worry about the rest of it, right? Focus for a couple of weeks on the middle paragraphs of the Shachri and the Musaf Amida for Shabbat. Because a lot of times people say, why do we say the Amidah so many times? Right. Well, we're not. It's different. It's not the same Amidah. Right. It's, that's <laughs> right. The, and um, it, right. It really is different. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to jump into two more different ones at this point. But if, if you looked at the weekday, if you looked at the holiday, if you looked at the, at the um, Yom Tov Musaf, um, we're gonna. I, I want to do those those two next time. I want to do the Yom Tov ones and the weekday weekday, which has the thirteen blessings in the middle. Whoa, whoa! Like, how do we go from one blessing, Mikdash Shabbat? That's real simple. I like that. That's that's condensed. Now thir thirteen. I, I need like some counting device. <laughs> You know, like I need like those little ranger beads that you count as you walk, you know, so that you know how far you walked. I need a spiritual Fitbit to get through 13 blessings. <laughs> uh, good. Any other questions? Anything? 